Hi, I'm Joe Dalton and welcome to Breakthrough Brands, the show that tells how Ireland's entrepreneurial DNA is rebooting the country one successful startup at a time. In this series, we'll demystify the process of starting up your own enterprise and growing it into a successful business by sharing the inspirational, educational, real-life experience of ordinary Irish business people. We talk to entrepreneurs who have taken control of their own destiny by doing what they love. On today's show, we have Andy Paul. Andy has over 30 years experience as a sales professional and vice president of sales with enterprises ranging from Fortune 1000 companies to technological startups. As a founder and principal of Sales Action Group, he has consulted with numerous CEOs to help them discover the key to consistent sales success. Andy is also an accomplished author and keynote speaker. Hello, Andy, and welcome to Breakthrough Brands. How are you today? Joe, thank you very much for having me on the show. I'm, I'm great. I'm delighted to have you on. Uh, as a fellow podcaster, uh, myself would be a newbie, and you would be probably one of the big grandfathers of podcasting. Tell me this. Tell me. Sure. I know that you, in your podcasts, you interview a lot of people like ourselves, but I want to, you, I want to hear your story. I want to hear the audience to know who you are so where did it all begin for yourself in in sales how you got into business and where what led you to where you are now (laughs) a long tortured path i think but um i'm probably like a lot of people i i I don't say i got into sales by default but i sort of did i mean after i graduated from from college I had not made any plans about what I was going to do afterwards, <laughs> and, and I was so focused on just getting through college. And uh, I took sort of a summer off, did some, you know, part-time jobs and so on. And then, as I looked at what were the job positions that were open and available uh, for recruiters coming to campus, uh, a lot of them seemed to be sales-oriented. And IBM and Burroughs, big big companies selling big computer systems and so on. So that's what I sort of again by default just sort of said, okay, that sounds interesting. I didn't have any real you know drive to say, yeah, I need to be in sales. But then once I got in it uh, and sort of got through the first <laughs> first year of terror of going out and making cold calls and learning how to do everything, it it started to become a lot of fun. And from there. So from there, so I worked for a big computer company called Burroughs when I started my career, got promoted into management very quickly, and then in, uh, <laughs> worked, worked for Apple in the early days of Apple, where I was really sort of one of the first software evangelists that Apple had. Uh, so my job was, I was in charge of marketing uh, apples into small businesses. And the so preach, I was out the trying to get software developers to, to create applications for the Apple II and Apple III. Wow. My my sister and I've mentioned it a few times before. She built the Apple factories uh, here in in Ireland. Uh, <gasps> she, she, Very interesting. Yeah, she knew Steve Jobs through the contracts that she had. Like she built a lot of the pharmaceuticals as well. But yeah, she 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 was on speed dial with him. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I knew Steve. Um, I don't think I ever remembered who I was, even though I was like in quarterly management meetings, you know, presenting things, but. Um, yeah, some interesting stories that probably aren't fit for for telling on the <laughs> podcast. But uh, but then after Apple is, I was there for a couple of years and got recruited to work for a company that was building the first battery powered laptop computer, and uh, went and built the retail distribution sales channel for them. And that just sort of started me in a journey of working for a variety of of uh, startup companies, both in Silicon Valley and in Southern California, and spent. Probably 15 years uh, traveling the world selling large communication systems, satellite-based communication systems, uh, very you know, large, complex, high-dollar ticket um, sales, and then started my own company in 2000 to really help small businesses learn how to compete against bigger companies, and that's in sales. And so that's sort of what I focused on. And it wasn't until about 2010 I got remarried. I moved from San Diego to New York, and took that chance to say, okay, well, what, what do I want to do this next stage of my career in sales? And had the idea of writing my first book and 
that was sort of a unexpected success. Uh, it was called Zero Time Selling. Yeah. And from there, that just sort of led into a different path away from sort of consulting with companies to being more of a uh, you know, public speaker and uh, working with companies on sort of workshops and seminars to help them think differently about how they're selling and how they develop their processes and how they train their people and led to the podcast. And you have a couple, of, and you have a couple of locations right. now as well, do you? You, well, I split, I split time between New York and San Diego, yeah. San Diego, yeah. I love San Diego. I worked in San Diego many moons ago when I used to be working for an American company, uh, Autosource, where we used mm-hmm, to right. jump on uh, we used to jump on aircraft carriers and uh, sell cars uh, to the American uh, Navy force as they were heading around the world. Very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. I'll tell you a couple of yeah. stories about that sometime. <laughs> <laughs> nine thousand, sure. nine thousand people on a ship, and when someone when I when I said I'm going to go for a walk, and and someone says you don't go walking around here, there's nine thousand people on this ship, and they're not all saints and scholars. One of them might mug you. I went okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like well, like small cities, right? It is. You're yeah. all in very confined places. Yes, yes. You work eighteen hours a day. Well, that's 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 a different day's story. You seem to be through your through your career looking that you know. You're Working with Apple and then working with a with a company with um, certain with battery operated uh, laptops seem to be very creative when it comes to the sales and marketing. So you're brought into a company who have a product and go, look, we need help. What can you do? Would it be correct in saying that? Yeah, I mean, oftentimes, yeah, for a long period of time, and even before I started. My- own company that was sort of why investors and management teams brought me into the company as to they sort of hit a plateau and yeah you know, how do we get past the plateau when were you self-taught or was there a time in your training that you were you were educated to be a professional salesperson well the first company i worked for burroughs they had fairly in-depth training programs none of which i would recommend anybody take today because you know the world has changed so much. They were the training ground. Really, I think more than anything was that base room, base of classroom training. But really, from the moment you start at that job, uh, it was a field sales position. And we sold in a, it's in the San Francisco Bay Area that you talk about one of your favorite areas in the world. And you know, eight thirty to eight thirty in the morning, the boss would walk into the office, and we we're all sitting in this big bullpen with all the salespeople, and he'd turn the lights off on the sales in the sales room, and we just had to leave. And go make cold calls, yeah. and so it was that months, really, of well, years actually, of, of going out and making cold calls day after day after day. That was really the training ground, and that things I still apply today. Yeah, the the twit has the twitching stopped, has it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell I tell a story about uh, sort of early in the days of, of going out and making the calls is. Literally by noon, I would be I'd be burned out, and so I grabbed lunch and just sort of decompress. Uh, I was in the East Bay area in Oakland, California, and there was this place you could drive and park your car and eat lunch, which was basically like at the foot of the runway of Oakland International Airport. So there was a lot of air traffic coming in. I was sort of you know fascinating to watch the planes land and take off and sort of fantasize about <laughs> why can't I be on one of those planes going somewhere? <laughs> and what I noticed is that as I drove away from that lunch many days, it was the exact same people that were there. And they're all like me. They're all young people dressed up in their three-piece suits with the white shirts and red power ties. <laughs> and I just started laughing because it was like, yeah, we're all going through the same thing here. It's yeah. just like... Their vision, bo- how- their vision board under their arm. <laughs> <laughs> right. We're all just like tired after four hours of beating our heads against the wall and and wondering if you know this is really the life for us and um yeah yeah do, you know, misery loves do, company do, do, yeah do you remember when you were young well i remember myself when i was in my you know my 19 20 and being in sales and you know writing in that you know i want to be a millionaire by the age of 25 because nothing existed after you were 25 <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, well, you're, I'm sure you're like me. You know, I look in the mirror and I still see the the 21 year old. So, yeah. um, <laughs> just it's hiding in there somewhere, saying, "Why am I trapped in this body now?" But yes, um, I, but it was a great learning experience. I mean, just going out, and this is the thing that oftentimes new sellers don't get these days. And it's not the same if you're making 
you know, 30, 40 calls a day on the phone as it is to go out, be confronted with somebody in person, uh, gatekeepers, administrators, people that weren't going to let you in the door even, and and make your way. It, it, you know, the old, it was the comb, buzz the buzzer, and the receptionist would, hello, hello, and you'd have the comb, and you'd be rubbing it up against the speaker. <laughs> so, mm. And do you know, there's, the, the one thing that I laugh about, the, the receptionist, you think you're the only person that's trying this trick on them, or, you know, when you, when you were younger and you were trying to get through... The, the amount of people are doing this and they're well used to it every day it's not a new trick or a new thing so you was 20 going I'm trying this and you're going here listen here sonny boy pull up your britches you're, you know you're dealing with someone as a professional receptionist go away you know <laughs> yeah well, I had a, a colleague who's a uh, you know, lifelong friend of mine who <laughs> at one point decided that all those receptionists really I shouldn't be trying to sell anything he thought he said yeah they're really this is like you know, a modern version of Match.com. And for him, it was it was a dating service, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so you know, I was always laughing at how many of the receptionists that uh, you'd come across, and they'd say, oh, do you know so-and-so? I'd say, yeah, well, how do you know? Well, we went out on a date last week. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'm sure our listeners now are taking notes, and all the, the receptionists around the country now will be, will be all wined and dined in the next couple of months. <laughs> T- tell me... You mentioned cold calling. Do you think that business has changed in the last decade when it comes to professional salespeople and cold calling? Tell me this. We're talking about cold calling. And a lot of, in the last decade, um, cold calling has changed. And there's this belief that we don't need to cold call anymore, that it's all inbound, will save the day. What are your thoughts or your opinions on on that process <laughs> so here's and I wrote about this in my second book Amp Up Your Sales I said you know the ideal world the utopian vision of sales would be that marketing is proficient enough at what they do that they could generate a sufficient bounty of well qualified leads that sales can follow up on to the point where sales wouldn't have to make any cold calls but the fact is we don't live in that environment marketing's not able to not and you know the open question whether you know that utopian world could ever exist. So, you know, if you're not getting enough leads from marketing, then you have to go out and make cold calls. <laughs> it's it's that simple, and you have to do what you have to do. And I actually put together a a formula that I work with some companies on. I had a slide presentation. What I call understanding your lead deficit. So when you get to the beginning part of the year, like now, is every sales rep should be able to go back, and if they're not completely served by by inbound leads, which again, most aren't. That's just a little formula I put together. I said, okay, well this is based on your close rates and your conversion rates and so on. And the number of inbound leads you have. This is how many leads you need to generate yourself. How are you gonna do it? Yeah. And and for most sales people, the answer is, well I gotta pick up the phone and start making calls. Yeah, and uh, there's the fear you know, and the reason why I, I believe that the inbound was su- such a success, as in it was a trickery to believe that okay, we don't need to do this anymore. Because look, I'll be my hand on heart, and I think every other salesperson, we all do hate cold calling. Oh yes, you know, everybody does. But it's part of the business, and it's the tough slog of the business that gets the rewards. You know, I got into sales because I could write my own paycheck, and it was, right. and there was the 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 hard work to educate myself and get myself up to the, to making that that money. But it's we're we're like we're one of my colleagues is saying, you know, I'm dealing with millennials at the moment, and they don't want to make calls. And they go, well, unfortunately, a business won't survive without the phone. Well, I find it sort of an interesting, I don't necessarily call it a paradox, but, you know, at least in Silicon Valley, there's there was this trend sort of in the late 2000s that investors were interested in investing in companies that had a sales force because they thought we had sort of gotten past that point. And... Ironically, now with the incredible growth in the software as a service business, though in the way we structure our inside sales teams with our sales development reps and our account execs, well, actually employment and sales, I believe, is probably overall is going up 
because more and more companies, certainly in tech space, are using sales and using outbound calling and cold calling as a way, as a primary part of their, their mix to get in touch with new prospects. Now, so, and those, those entry level jobs, those sales development rep jobs, they're all millennials. Yeah. So, I, I, well, I think there's this. I don't know, maybe a myth to some degree about and that's you know, it. millennials don't millennials don't make calls. Hey, I, I can point to hundreds of companies where millennials are driving the sales engine because they're making cold calls. I, I, yeah, and I would agree with you there. Do the, the, the other thing that's just come back on what you mentioned is with marketing. I've, I've seen so many companies who just have salespeople and they're calling and don't spend any money on marketing. And then I've other, right. I see other companies that are investing in marketing and don't have any real sales team. And and it's a case of you need both. As as you had um, Jay Abraham on there the other week and, and one of mm-hmm. Jay, Jay's sayings is a company that doesn't market is, is a hobby. Yeah. Well, I think that this is this is the thing that's again is is a difficulty oftentimes for a lot of smaller businesses, smaller enterprises, is that when somebody starts this business, is they like and they gravitate toward this idea of marketing because marketing is is easier, and they think marketing is going to bring customers in, and they oftentimes get into trouble because marketing's not enough. And yeah, you know, I was at a looking at one small business website or a small business resource, uh, and you know they had all these categories of topics that they serve. You know the tens of thousands of small businesses that visit the site every day, and then the categories were there were like ten of them. And I, I asked my son who works for me. I said, "So, what's missing in that list?" And he goes, "Yeah, it's not. There's no sales. There's marketing. There's everything else but sales." And this is very typical. Really, is, is small businesses find it a little easier, at least initially. Oh, it's comfortable. I don't, you know, I can market. I don't have to go out and actually talk to somebody and sell. And then they start learning the hard lesson is, well, no, I do need to go out and sell. And you know, there's there's just not enough focus put on that. And that's that's one of the things I work with with companies on is, well, yeah, great, marketing is interesting, and you do need to invest in it, but. You also got to go out and sell. Yeah, I, I think it's a combination of both. I I believe that they should be now when I, when marketing. What is marketing? It's it's writing that content. It's it's posting. It's social selling on on LinkedIn or on Facebook. It's it's Google AdWords. It's all the the remarketing, the email remarketing. I take mm-hmm. that as as marketing, marketing, and it's the sales. Okay these are the guys that I need to speak to and maybe some of these have seen my information so what what I'm trying to get at is you marketing is warming the person up to take yes. the call yes absolutely yeah now there's some some entrepreneurs I've worked with who uh, one example of a entrepreneur I worked with who was selling very technical product not inexpensive you know anywhere from like 35 to 65 thousand dollars and generated about, I would say, 80% of the company's revenue was each year was generated by leads through Google AdWords. I mean, he was this guy was just a pro. He was just he had it figured out, and we they still had to do some cold calling, but but you know the bulk of what they were selling was coming through great marketing. Well, that that's fantastic, but it was very unusual. Right compared to most companies, you know, everyone goes well. Look at look at uh, Google AdWords. Of course, it works. They they made thirty billion last year, and I always kind of go, <laughs> they made thirty billion last year. That was people trying out AdWords. You know, like the amount of companies, like our company, we help SMEs and and professionals with our AdWords. So we do all the research and we we mm-hmm. check out and. What we learn is before someone gets in touch with us, they've already spent two, three grand on AdWords and they're not getting anywhere. So, oh, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's hard to target. It's expensive. Yeah. So Google is 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 Google are going. Oh, okay, we spent thirty million. How much is that of people that actually tried it and made the hands of it and don't want to go near it again? Right. It's yeah. A, yeah. And and it's it's if just going back to the the entrepreneurs and the startups, you're spot on. And if, when these guys have, they're innovative. They created a product, but they don't know how to sell. 
and it's that education so that that they need so with your company do you go in look at the whole sales process and do you teach the person the sales techniques as well yeah that that is i have and it, but it's not as big a part of my business now just because of, of how my business has evolved yeah. with with uh, speaking and and workshops and other things that i'm doing podcast included but yeah, it used to be the central part of my business. I'd go in, an entrepreneur usually would find themselves in a position where sales, as I said before, it sort of plateaued out, they had stopped. And for me, the, the sweet spot was companies that had been in business for a while, they're still small enterprises, but had been in business for a while, but let's that hit that, that slow growth patch. And they're looking to say, okay, well, how do I, how do I get back on the path of, of growth again? And yeah, so I come in, I do a, a deep, deep dive, like I'm sure a lot of consulting firms do. I talk to literally everyone that was involved in the selling process or was customer facing, not necessarily in sales, but customer facing within the company, all of the executive team. I talk to customers and partners, you know, extensively and and then come up with a a recommended plan for the company that sometimes entailed, yeah, changing their selling process, sometimes talked about, you know, increasing their investment in marketing. Uh, sometimes had to do with customer service and customer successes in terms of how they dealt with their customers after they had had won the business. And sometimes it was all of those together. It really just depended on on what the needs of the company were. And and then, yeah, at least fifty percent of the time, they'd ask me to sort of stick around and help them implement that. It's. I think it's the start of it. Really, is helping them with their mindset on it. Uh, Andy, as um, Alan Wise um, would say, it's with a company, if they want to go up to the next level, it's to do with their mindset. Would you believe in sales for a company to reach greatness? They have to change their mindset first. Well, I think, yes, there's there's aspects of the mindset they'll probably have to reset. Um, and I think that... that it could be in, in several, one of several different dimensions. You know, it could just be about sales, as you said. It could be about their investment in marketing and what their vision is, what they can achieve. Stop. And ironically, I found some companies that really had to do with how they serviced their customers. I mean, I had one client yeah. that that when they got their mindset changed about how they how they serve their existing customers, they suddenly found that the amount of revenue and percentage of revenue that they were getting from their existing customers went from you know 30, 40 percent year over year to Two thirds of their business every year was coming from existing customers, and they kept growing their new business development. And suddenly, the company was just taking off and thriving. But it was really from that base of wow, we really had to change the way we treated our existing customers. Go from a less adversarial approach to what can we do to you know, if you have an issue, what can we do to solve that issue as quickly as possible? Yeah, I stop crying in the corner and pick up the phone. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, and um, but it was it was, sim- it was little things that just sent off a message to their customers that yeah, that I, it was all it was not about the customers, it was about them and their convenience. And I was like, well, yeah, that's that's backwards, right? I mean, it's simple things like this one CEO is you know, when a customer had to return a product is they would charge the customer for shipping. <laughs> no. Sorry. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's 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 a good mark, isn't it? Yeah, so you think about the mindset involved, yeah, in that, right? Yeah, and yeah. so we got that turned around completely, and suddenly it just made a huge difference for them. We're just going to take a short break. This show was sponsored by Harris Myers, your sales and marketing agency, helping you develop a better sales and marketing pipeline. Yeah, it's. Um, I think, and the, the the bad old motor trade gets a, gets a terrible hammering hammering as well. When when we mention bad salespeople, and you know, I spent majority of my life in it. So, uh, yeah, but uh, by the other hand, though, there are you know, the auto industry, at least in the U.S., is is there's these massive, you know, I say massive companies, but these companies that you know roll out these massive training programs for auto dealerships and yeah and. And more than most industries, I think there is sort of a, a real training emphasis there that uh, I would say in the auto industry, probably more training takes place of the salespeople than in high tech companies. Yeah, and I, I would have to say I've seen salespeople and they were trained just to be rude and obnoxious. And I think for myself was I the question, what makes a good salesperson for me? It's empathy. Um, 
and developing that skill and growing it and and proud to say that you're a salesperson you know some people hide behind oh I'm you know I'm a salesperson and you know stand tall and be proud that you are because it is a profession well yeah and it's it's a conversation actually I was having with someone yesterday on a another podcast that I was a, a guest on is 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 yeah, it's weird. this person I was talking with was bemoaning the fact that salespeople go to great lengths, at least in the U.S., to hide the fact on their business cards that they're actually in sales. Right? There are all these creative titles that people come up with to to try to cloak the fact that they're in sales. And I agree with you. As you're in sales, the fact is you're not fooling the customer. They know you're in sales. So that business card is something you're doing yeah. for yourself. <laughs> and if you're only doing something for yourself, just admit this is what you do. I, I must one day sit down and list out how many different names are used for a salesperson on their business card. I'm sure it's dozens. We'll have a competition, see who comes up with the most <laughs> on it. Well, and, but the, yeah, another thing that's sort of interesting too is, is increasingly you know, people don't have business cards, right? Because yeah, just connect with me on LinkedIn or Facebook or yeah, whatever. Yeah. And um, but nonetheless, yeah, and their email signatures or something. Have and it. the companies companies sort of aid and abet this, and they I think they don't understand they're really doing themselves a disservice by not having their salespeople call themselves salespeople because again, everybody knows that's what it is. And you were, to your point earlier, it's a profession. You need to take pride in the profession you're in and look work on improving your craft at all times and stand tall. Goes back to mindset. It goes way back to mindset, way back absolutely. To so tell me then, the podcasts. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know, what are you up to, six, 700 podcasts at the moment? Um, are you... <laughs> I, think, uh, I think today it was 610 or something. 610, you must look back and go, wow. What I have found myself personally from doing the radio show and the podcasts, I have learned so much from people that I interview like yourself. Do you know, we, we all have, we're all experienced in, in one or two things but the knowledge that I have learned over the year that when I started this has been unbelievable so with yourself 610 podcasts on it must be amazing well I tell people that they ask why I started it and I said well I really had a pretty selfish motivation I chose to learn from other people continue to learn yeah. I mean I'm, I've always been a you know active learner in my life and you know read extensively and interested in in a variety of topics and and yeah to me once especially once we started it was like yeah i'm really doing this almost more for myself than anybody else because i really enjoy this and every day i stop to speak to someone new i learn something new it's it's also it, like when i started the show as well it, it has evolved it was very national, but now it's grown to international. Did you find mm -hmm. that when you when you were running the, sh the show in, in six, seven months, it sort of took a different direction to what you were expecting in the beginning? Absolutely. And we're actually sort of in the process of <laughs> changing directions again. So, yeah, I really started the show with the idea that the, the focus was going to be on helping small and medium-sized enterprises sort of get in touch with what's happening in terms of state-of-the-art selling, right? This is sort of the leading edge, bleeding edge of sales processes and technologies and so on, largely derived out of the, the tech business and in Silicon Valley, using Silicon Valley broadly as, as the tech industry. And in my work with a variety of companies, I found that they're really lagging in terms of just their understanding of the tools and technologies and processes available that they could use to grow their business. So that's what I sort of started with. But then as we got into it, yeah, about, uh, I don't know, about six months or so into it, yeah, we suddenly uh, we started expanding, talking more about uh, marketing, leadership, uh, more about technologies perhaps than even anticipated. Um, and so, you know, over time, it's really morphed into something that we're initially, I thought we were more reaching uh, individual salespeople. I, we still do, but but a core of the audience is, is senior management yeah. and CEOs and, and so on. And uh, that's really sort of been our, our most steady base. And that's with ourselves, like we sort of, the audience that we're aiming for is entrepreneurs and CEOs. And the show here is, 
sales, marketing and entrepreneurship as well and try and push that and focus to help other people. Um, I need to ask you just where can people find you or if they're interested in getting one of your books or finding out more about uh, sure. your company? Give us the details there. Sure. Well, books are available on Amazon. Um, so Amp Up Your Sales, my second book, Zero Time Selling, first book. Podcast is called Accelerate with Andy Paul. And obviously on iTunes or any of the uh, podcast directories, you can you can find it. And uh, you can also check it out on my website at andypaul.com. And yeah, if people want to contact me, obviously you can connect with me on LinkedIn as you and I got connected via LinkedIn show. But uh, you can also just do something old fashioned like drop me an email, uh, andy at zerotimeselling.com. And uh, yeah, I'd be glad to have a conversation. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, my, my own goal, uh, the next step for myself is keynote speaking um, and getting in to talk to companies in Europe and the States on prospecting, using sales and marketing as a tool mm -hmm. on it. Um, I need to... Well, I, think, work, I, think, well, I think there's an uh, endless appetite for people to learn about prospecting. So Yeah, definitely. I'm gonna, what's the best, we're coming to the end of the show, so I need to ask you, what's the best business advice that you've ever received? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. What's the best business advice I ever? Yeah, I, I don't know if it's, you know, specific advice. I mean, I, I would, uh, I think it was a lesson I learned growing up from, from my parents was yeah. that, yeah, you know, at the end of the day, when your life is at, at a, you know, coming to a close, is the only thing that you have that you serve as a legacy is really your character and your, your integrity. And they really stress that. And that, I think, you know, more than anything is, is stuck with me throughout my entire career is, is just, you know, deal from a position of honesty and character and integrity, uh, treat people fairly. Uh, and you'll be treated fairly in return. Uh, you had a great lesson in this with my first job interview, with my first job. Um, if you have just a minute, I can tell you the story. Yeah, it's go just, ahead, yeah. yeah. Um, so I was, I was interviewing for this big computer company, Burroughs, and, and a sales manager that I was interviewing with calls me into this conference room, and this is a man I learned afterwards, had very, <laughs> very economical with his words, and even when he got to know you. And so the first question he asked me in the interview, and I was not prepared for it at all, was about accounting because we we're selling mini computers and bigger computers to, to companies, primarily for bookkeeping and accounting applications. And I'd studied it in college, but I was so unprepared for the idea that that was going to be the lead question <laughs> that, I, that I froze. Yeah. And so first thought in my mind was, well, gosh, you know, how am I going to tell my parents that I blew my first interview? But um, but as I started thinking about it, I said, well, well I said to, the, to Ray, the gentleman I was interviewing with, I said, look, you know, I, I know the answer to this question. I just can't summon it right now because uh, <laughs> it's escaping me. But if you'll, but I don't want to BS you with an answer. So if you'll let me you know, leave and I'll research the answer and I'll get back to you, I'll call you tonight with, with the answer and we, maybe we can talk again tomorrow. And with that, he closes his notebook that he's taking notes on and gets up without saying a word and leaves the room. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh, shoot. You know, I just, I just, I just blew this. And I was in this conference for myself for about five minutes and finally another man comes in the door and he introduced himself and he was the boss of the whole operation. And he said, so, I hear from Ray that he wants to hire you. And that was the sum of my interview. That was it. You were honest. So, so the, so the fact that I refused to try to BS him and just came clean with the fact that I was I was stuck and you know if I get research the answer and get back to him as quickly as I could, that was all it took. That's, that's a good story. <laughs> yeah. And so that obviously you know reinforced everything I've been taught, but also you know stuck with me that you know especially in sales, it's just just don't you don't need to go there. No. Be I, yourself. Be authentic. Tell the truth. Deal with people honestly. They they can tell. Right, yeah. they can tell. People can smell BS, and people can smell desperation as well. And absolutely, yeah. And you're right. I believe myself. I treat everyone the way I would like to be treated myself. And end of end of story. 
yeah, and it's, that is such a simple lesson for people to learn, and yet it's it's so hard. I, you know, again, devolving, digressing from the story is, if I had a client that that, um, you know, he 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 came into the office one day while I was there, and he was just going on a, a rant about how he tried to get hold of somebody to uh, a customer service operation to help him with the problem he was having with this computer and you know it's just on and on and on and on I said so you think that that having to go through you know an unintended op- operator and then go through a you know a voice treat thing is is bad service goes, oh yeah it's horrible so I said well hang on a second so <laughs> while he was sitting there I, I picked up the phone and I dialed his number at his business and handed it to him and it goes hi this is so-and-so welcome to hang on for these options right yeah but that's exactly what he did to his customer. <laughs> yeah, I hate this. Yeah, I, yeah. I, he said I hate it, but this is what you're doing to your customers. That's why I, when I'm online and I'm checking something, and I get it, I want. To, I always ask questions to see if I'm speaking to a bot or a real human being. You know. <laughs> yeah, they, well, it, for the bot, you have to make sure you have something personal. Yeah, like how's the weather today, or have you any children, or you know. Right. <laughs> so, so, the, the children's a good one. Tell me, um, book. What book would you recommend? Other than my own. Of course, under the DF, where you promoted your books. <laughs> you can, and you'd be biased as well, so. Yeah. You know, there's, so I sort of contrary in view of that. It's, is, so my, my sort of catch-all recommendation is that salespeople should read Shakespeare. Interesting. Because we're in a communications business. Yeah. And you have to develop an appreciation for language. And we become so careless and la- lazy with our language because we can take shortcuts with our texting and messaging and so on. Is that language and words still matter? Macbeth and, is great. And and I think there's no better place to learn just how words matter than reading Shakespeare or poetry. I mean, I love poetry, and I, so I recommend you know poetry for people as well because yeah. then you're seeing why words matter and how words matter, how powerful they can be. And I just think it's a great lesson for salespeople to learn. What song would you like us to play out with, Andy? <laughs> what song would you like what to play song? out with? Ding. Yeah, anything, anything by the Beatles. Okay. I'm gonna, did I, do, we have, do you have Beatles? Yeah, we do. We have a couple, a couple in the drawer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's something I, I mean, I love modern music and yeah, music of all types, but... Um, yeah, if I if I gotten into hip hop, but I, that's one area I don't know much about. But, yeah. Um, rap, yeah, on it. Yeah, on it. Andy, it's been a pleasure to have you on Breakthrough Brands. Uh, thank you very much for coming on, and we will we will chat again. I'm sure. Thank you. Well, Joe, it's been an honor. Thank you very much.
This show was sponsored by Harris Myers, your sales and marketing agency, helping you develop a better sales and marketing pipeline. 